Okay, we ended class on Monday with this image here. And we talked about these different types of impurities. And so let's just do a little roundup with that. So even though impurities might sound like a bad thing, they're not. <clears throat> if I take a silicon-based processing chip and I implant it with different things like arsenic or germanium, um, that process for computer chips is called doping. Then I can impart different properties on those computer chips. I talked about how Texas Instrument was the first company to come up with the electronic um, uh, transistor and they got seven years to make as much money as they can. And then that thing was um, produced by everybody and is continually produced by everybody. Those voltages were required to be about five volts to get the thing to function. And now we've gotten things down to about one and a half volts, 1.4 volts that we can get the transistor to turn on and off. And that's all about being able to dope the silicon with different types of impurities. If I um, add the impure carbon to iron, so I take soot and I pound it into iron, I end up with steel. So obviously steel is better than iron, more corrosion resistant. It's uh, more likely to break than bend, but it's more structurally sound. Then if uh, you guys mix copper and zinc together um, in 121 and you made brass, and so brass has properties that neither copper nor, um, nor zinc have. And so we get this alloy that ends up being much more useful than the um, either of the original substances. Okay, so I briefly put up this image where I was talking about something called a, a lattice structure and unit cells. And unit cells are the smallest portion of any lattice structure. And so a lattice structure is um, the organization of atoms or ions within a, um, a substance in its solid phase. So we're just going to talk about three of these. There are, I believe, 32 classes and 300 and some odd actual crystal lattices. And most of them are just about, instead of it being a square, they're more of a rhomboid. And so the organizations all are based off of these three characteristics. And so um, I guess with the exception of the hex, but they're all, um, they're all, they work in the same fashion. By that, I mean one unit cell combines with a bunch of other unit cells to create the entire crystal lattice. So our first one is the um, simple cubic. And the simple cubic is just a box with atoms in the corners. And there are eight corners to a box. And so what I have are eight atoms in the corners. <clears throat> but each one of those atoms only has one um, eighth of itself inside the box. So if we look at this second image here, this one here, you can see there's one eighth of an atom here. And so since there are eight one eighths, this thing holds one total atom. So this one will be connected to eight, uh, um, six other boxes. And then we end up with those six other one, two, three, four, five, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six. And when we add all these guys up, you end up obviously having entire atoms and your, the point is you can calculate the size of the atom knowing um, uh, some stuff about x-ray crystallography. So first off, we'll just say that we've got one atom in each one of these corners and each one of those corners has one eighth of the atom. And so there is actually one full atoms worth of atoms inside of this crystal lattice structure, even though it's only eighths of each of the atoms. The next one over looks just like the simple cubic, except there's also an atom sandwiched in the middle of that. And so I still got the eighths of eight atoms, giving me one atom, plus I've got the one atom in the middle. And so that gives me a total of two atoms per unit cell. My next one is called a face centered cubic. And so I've still got my eight eighths of atoms in the corners. And then on the faces, what I've got is half an atom, half an atom, half an atom on the back side, half on this side, half and on the bottom half. So that's um, one, two, three plus the corners is four. So a face centered cubic is more dense than these other ones because it's got four atoms fully in each cubic in each one of these unit cells. All right, so kind of the cool thing about 
knowing this, knowing what the structure is, is we can figure out the size of the atoms using X-ray crystallography and a little bit of geometry. So first off, if I knew the distance A, then I would know if I cut A in half, then I would have the radius of an atom. So if you pull out your periodic table, you can find that atom radiuses are on... Sorry, I'm pulling my table off the wall because, of course, I've got a periodic table hanging on my wall. It's on... It's on the back side, the side with the nuclear information, and it's on the left-hand side of the box, and it's the third, it's one in the middle, the third from the bottom or third from the top, called atomic radius, and it says in picometers, picometers. Um, it says PM, and that stands for picometers. Okay, so if I look at something like sodium, it says 186 picometers. Why is there an extra one? Three down from the top. That's all. Anyway, uh, hydrogen is 37, and helium... Well, that's not right. Oh, no, that's right. No. Uh, just a second. Okay, so I'm looking at the periodic table, and it's wrong. I'm not sure why it's wrong, but it says that helium's 128 picometers when I know it's like 31 or something like that. That's strange. All right, regardless, um, what I have here is an eighth of an atom in each one of these corners. And so this distance from here to here is half of an atom. So that would be the radius of an atom. So if I knew the distance from here to here from these corners of these lattices, then if I took half of that number, then I would get the radius of an atom. Okay. So that would be my atomic size. All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of algebra or geometry here. So um, B squared plus A squared and A squared, because these this is a right angle and these guys are of, this, of the same length. So this is just um, uh, Pythagorean's theorem. And here's the more normal version of Pythagorean's theorem. So if I go from this corner to that corner, that's C, and then that's this distance from here to that corner is B, and then this distance here is A. All right, so A squared, B squared, C squared, that's gotta be equal since it's a triangle. So what we've done is we've taken this B squared here, this B squared here, and I've taken A squared and A squared, and I've substituted them in for the B squared. And that gives me A squared plus A squared plus A squared, which is three A squared, combining like terms. And then I square root both sides, and I get C is equal to um, uh, square root of three times A, and I can rearrange it a little bit better for A, and I can get A's size, which is gonna be A is equal to four R divided by a square root of three, okay? And then for the face centered cubic, what I've got here, the distance here is oh, an atomic radius, an atomic diameter, and an atomic radius. So B is what we're after. And then we can get A as well. So um, B is 4R. So one radius, one radius, one radius, one radius. That's four radiuses. And then if we use uh, Pythagorean's theorem again, we can take uh, 16R squared because it was four and it's squared. So I've taken this four and squared it, made it a 16. And then I've taken this R and squared it because the B was squared. And then I'm combining these two terms, A squared gives me two A squared. And then if I um, rearrange this, divide things out, then I end up with A is equal to the square root of R. So you could be solving for R in each of these if you want as well. All right, so how do we, how do we get these A values? So we can figure out what the atomic radii are. We're going to use something called X-ray crystallography. And what X-ray crystallography does is you crystallize a solid into its um, crystalline structure. So it's a solid. 
And then the reason that we choose x-rays, <clears throat> I'm sorry about my voice, is x-rays are the correct wavelength to equal the radius of atoms. So we would be talking about gamma rays or visible light if the lengths of the atoms were different, but they're equivalent to the size of x-rays. All right, so oh, you can't see that. That's unfortunate. Copy this one second. I'll put this in, I don't know, paint. Oh, goodness, that's small. Resize. Okay, I'll bring this down. So that image, I'm sorry, I've got my Microsoft Word in black mode, dark mode, and so you can't see it very well. All right, so what ends up happening is x-rays get shot in to the atoms. The atoms' electrons absorb that energy from the x-rays, and then they shoot it out, or they scatter it. So this side is, is called the incident side, the side at which stuff is being hit, and then this is the scattered side. So in the same way that we were talking about light, as it travels through a substance, it can get bent. That's what's happening here, bending and scattering, same situation. So I've got this light this x-ray light coming in, hitting, and then scattering. The one below it, the same kind of thing happens. It hits this, um, this atom, um, which is the corner of one of the indices, and then it shoots off. And it follows the exact same pattern as the initial. So what you do is you tune your x-rays, because the x-rays is a band of wavelengths. You tune your x-rays to make sure that these peaks coincide with each other. The troughs coincide with each other. And the reason we're doing that is that gives us constructive interference. So the, the fact that those lights will add together and what we'll, you'll end up seeing is like a spot of light on a, uh, on a uh, screen, a projected screen. And that spot of light will only appear when the top X-ray and the bottom X-ray are in sync with each other. So how could they possibly be in sync with each other when they travel different distances? Well, what you do is you adjust the frequency, adjust the wavelength, so that when the bottom wavelength goes through this, it ends up going twice as far, twice as many atoms as the, the shorter indice. And this one down here would be three times as far. So you end up having them even though, um, so let's say this wave comes through, it hits, and it would be this wave right here, where this wave would be this one in front. But it's okay because it went exactly um, one atom further in distance, so the peaks still lined up with each other. And so because they're lining up with each other, they'll produce these bands, actually these, these spots, and then you can measure the distance between the spots, and that will tell you the distance between the atoms. Or sorry, it'll tell you the distances between the lattice points. And the lattice points are going to be these A's from there to there. And so if I know the distance from A to A, then I can figure out the radius of the atoms in any one of these situations. So X-ray crystallography has done a lot for us. It has allowed us to determine the size of atoms. It's allowed us to determine the shapes of different structures, and it allows us to figure out how different structures can interact with each other. So how does one substance interact with a protein inside your body? So if I know what the structure looks like, then I can create a structure that will fit inside of that protein. And so we could create a drug that would interact with a protein in a way that the protein would behave in a way that we want it to instead of the way that it is behaving. So you could cure a disease. Um, the most famous use of x-rays was Rosalind Franklin. Um, she was, oh, if you watch those videos and you understood that she was really hosed by a couple of um, chemists, uh, well, a chemist and a physics, um, Watson and Crick, one from England and one from uh, the United States. This is an unbelievably, this is the most famous x-ray crystallography image ever. This is called uh, image 51. And image 51 is super complicated, but what it is is um, proof that our DNA is in a double helical structure. And she got this image 
and the image was stolen from her and handed over to Watson and Crick by somebody named Maurice. And he, um, because they they had this image, instead of doing a bunch of math calculations, because they weren't very good at it, they just postulated a bunch of possibilities and then looked at this and realized which one it was. And so we got the double helical structure and they win the Nobel Prize for it, even though it was without this image, they wouldn't have been able to confirm that the double helical structure was correct. And so Rosalind should have been the one that won the Nobel Prize, not, not Watson and Crick, but uh, it was um, a not female friendly environment. <clears throat> it's uh, not as bad as it used to be. It's still not good, but it's not as bad as it used to be. And these guys are jerks, still jerks. Um, I wish they weren't, but they are. Um, and yeah, all right. That's, that's all I got for, uh, for the set of notes. Um, we'll move on to, uh, the next set in the next recording.